Testing, testing. Okay, so uh, welcome back to the second part of my lecture. Um, I crammed in a lot of stuff in the first 45 minutes, and um, I think I'm going to go a little bit slower now that we're getting into the fuel cell content. And so once again, we're focused on this idea of converting chemical energy and a fuel into electricity. We've talked about the foundations of thermodynamics, the first law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy, the second law of uh, thermodynamics, which would be the increase of entropy concept. And we still have not really talked at all about fuel cells, and the fuel cells is why we all came here. And so in this last hour, I want to spend all of my time just talking about fuel cells and how we apply thermodynamics to fuel cells to understand fuel cells and to model fuel cells. So then, uh, kind of my goals for this last part of the lecture will be to apply the first and second laws to fuel cells, also apply pro property models to fuel cells, and use these ideas to both look at the limits to the performance of a fuel cell thermodynamically, and also to compare the difference in the reactions between a fuel cell reaction and a combustion reaction. Because recall that BMW, at least in the past, was looking at using hydrogen but combusting hydrogen instead of using this in a fuel cell. Um, both are ways to convert chemical energy into work, and they both involve very different reactions, and the way that you design these reactions would be very, very different. Was it successful? Was it successful? Um, does anyone know the status of BMW? No. It's because they're they talking about uh, hydrogen in break moment. Right. So, even now talking about re enriching of natural gas. They are successful, of course, but who is buying it? <laughs> so the, the, the question. Everybody is successful. Everybody the question was: Was BMW successful in using hydrogen in the in their engine? Um, and I think one of the responses was: There is the, there is the concern about hydrogen and brittlement. Um, I guess now they're looking at enriching natural gas with hydrogen. Um, so a blend of natural gas and hydrogen. Um, and so that's where we are. Um, okay, so once again, some good quiz questions, think, things to think about as we move through this last hour. So once again, if you're coming from materials engineering, you may not have what I call this kind of dead weight of the Carnot hanging around your neck like mechanical engineers do. But mechanical engineers definitely have this dead weight of the Carnot efficiency, and we cling to this. And uh, it's hard for us to really, I think, when we come into the, this field of fuel cells, it's hard to understand what the second law limitation is to, uh, to the fuel cell efficiency. Um, and then once again, kind of with this dead weight of, this, of the Carnot efficiency around our necks as mechanical engineers, um, we come back to this question, does the efficiency of reversible fuel cell, hydrogen powered fuel cell, increase or decrease with temperature? Um, so this becomes a very non-intuitive result for mechanical engineers. Um, what is the relation between the reversible work of a fuel cell and the Gibbs function of the reaction? And so I'll, later on I'll define this Gibbs free energy or Gibbs function of the reaction. Um, and then this idea about the deviation of the performance of an actual fuel cell from an ideal and so in thermodynamics, we talk about ideal, we're talking about a reversible process, sometimes called a thermodynamically perfect process. So we have this deviation, and what I will be doing is, is tying this deviation into the concept of entropy generation. And so if you want to increase the performance of your fuel cell, ultimately you want to be decreasing entropy generation. So then as we kind of move through this last lecture, uh, we'll be comparing thermodynamically fuel cells and combustion reactions, coming up with quantitative or equations to quantify the maximum fuel cell work, efficiency, and electrical potential. Um, look at the deviation of the actual work, efficiency, and electrical potential from this reversible or maximum amount, and relating this to entropy generation. So then. Ultimately, we can start with some chemical I had a pointer one minute ago and I laid it okay, I found it. 
Okay, so then ultimately, once again, what we want to look at is this chemical energy in the fuel. And we want to somehow convert this chemical energy into electrical work. And in the first kind of part, I was talking about this classical method where we take the, this chemical fuel and we combust it. And then we convert this chemical energy into thermal energy and we drive this heat engine. And the heat engine converts the thermal energy into work, uh, shaft work. We can convert this shaft work at least theoretically with 100% efficiency into electrical work. Um, and this Carnot efficiency, once again, defines this conversion of thermal energy into work defined by the green boundary. Uh, we can, can go from one form of work to another, at least theoretically, with 100% conversion efficiency. So this is where we are right now in terms of our kind of energy economy. Um, and so we could draw a similar thing for like your car engine, except the shaft work would be driven down, or shaft work would drive your car down the road. And so the fuel cell then offers an, al an alternate conversion process where we can take some fuel that has chemical energy and we go through what's called a direct energy conversion process. Direct as opposed to indirect because this is indirect. We convert chemical energy into thermal energy, thermal energy into work. And the fuel cell, we have a direct ener energy conversion of chemical energy into work. Um, and so because we have different processes, the way that we look at this thermodynamically and the thermodynamic limits are gonna vary between these two types of systems. And then as I stated, this Carnot efficiency only applies to what's inside this green boundary. So it's, since we don't have the conversion of heat into work, the fuel cell is not governed by the uh, Carnot efficiency. So then in this last hour, we're gonna be focusing, focusing on the, this reaction process. In both cases, we have uh, a fuel coming in, we have a reaction, we have products coming out, chemical products. In one case, we're gonna be producing only heat transfer. The second case, we'll have both heat transfer and also electrical work. And so then the way that we design this reaction is very, very different. We can use the same fuel, hydrogen, in both cases, but the way that we re you design the, the reaction becomes very, very different. So then I wanna talk about just a, a generic reaction. Um, and so I'm gonna specifically focus in on hydrogen. And so we have hydrogen and oxygen reacting to form water. Um, and in the combustion reaction, we're not producing any work. We produce heat transfer. In the fuel cell reaction, we produce both work and also heat transfer. And so then when I start to develop a mathematical model, I can look at that at this in a very general case where I may have work, so the work can be greater than or equal to zero, um, I'll definitely have heat transfer out. So then going back to my energy balance, um, and so we said that energy can enter and leave the system in three forms um, by mass flow, and so we have these mass flow terms now because we have fuel and oxygen entering the system, we have the products leaving the system, we have energy possibly leaving as work and energy possibly leaving as heat transfer. Um, we, your fuel cell tends to operate or the combustion process at steady state. And so if we think about the total amount of energy inside the system, we say that remains constant. So the energy that comes in is equal to the energy that leaves. And then we can write this on a one kilomole of hydrogen basis where we divide through by um, the moles of hydrogen. We come up with these stoichiometric coefficients, one, one half, and one. Um, and then this term in the, the parentheses is minus the enthalpy of the reaction. So the enthalpy of reaction is products minus reactants. Here, excuse me, right. The enthalpy of reaction is products minus reactants. Here we have reactants minus products. So we have a minus sign in front. So we come up with this very short and simple energy balance. The energy that comes out due to electricity and as heat transfer must equal the energy being released by the reaction. So this becomes our um, generic energy balance. Once again, for the combustion reaction, this electrical work goes to zero. So keeping the energy balance at the top, I can move down to my entropy balance. 
And so once again, we assume that the fuel cells operate at steady state, so we don't have the accumulation or a decrease of entropy inside the system with time. So this left-hand term goes to zero. Once again, this is the change of entropy inside the system. We've seen that, that we assume that's going to be zero. We have entropy that enters due to the mass flows of hydrogen and our oxygen. We have entropy that leaves due to heat transfer and due to mass flow. And then we have this entropy generation term at the, at the end. Um, and I will come back and talk a lot about this entropy, entropy generation term as we move forward because that's going to be another, that's uh, a metric that we can use to quantify the performance of our fuel cell and our fuel cell design. So then similar to our energy balance then, we can divide this equation by the number of moles of, so I think I'm missing n's here, so these s it should be del n, del n, del n, um, where the n is my number of moles. Um, so then we can divide through by the number of moles of hydrogen. We come up with the stoichiometric coefficients, one, one half, and one. And we have a similar uh, entropy of the reaction, where the entropy of the reaction is the ent entropy of the products minus the entropy of the reactants. Here we have reactants minus products. We have a minus sign out in front. And once again, we come up with this relatively short form for our entropy balance. So the heat transfer out is minus the temperature um, of the reaction, delta S for the reaction plus T, entropy being generated. So in terms of fuel cells, we'll come back to this. We want to minimize the energy that comes out as heat transfer. Um, and so we want to be minimizing this entropy generation term because as this entropy generation term becomes large, Q out becomes large. So we keeping the energy balance at the top and the entropy balance here. Um, for this hydrogen reacting with oxygen, both delta H of the reaction and delta S of the reaction are both less than zero. Um, and then for a combustion reaction, we don't have any electricity being produced. And we come up with this form for the heat transfer out, where once again the heat transfer out is uh, T delta S for the reaction plus T entropy being generated. Um, and so the entropy generation is delta H for the reaction divided by T plus delta S for the reaction. And this becomes a very, very large number. And so when you look at a like combustion powered heat engine and you're trying to figure out, at least theoretically, if you wanted to improve the performance of the combustion process or that this combustion powered heat engine by reducing entropy generation, just based on this calculation, you would say a lot of entropy is generated through combustion. And so if you knew nothing about fuel cells, you could go through this calculation determine that a lot of entropy is being generated here, and then that can lead you to say, okay, how can I redesign the combustion reaction to create less entropy? And that's actually what we're doing in the fuel cell is we've taken a combustion reaction and we've re-engineered it. We've re-engineered the fuel cell reaction so that we decrease the entropy being generated, which increases the overall performance of our energy conversion device. So then, So then this entropy being generated becomes fixed by the chemical reaction. So as soon as we say that we're taking hydrogen and we're reacting with it with oxygen and we fix the temperature and we fix the pressure, based on property models, we fix delta H and we fix delta S. So as engineers, there's nothing that we can do to change those, to change this entropy generation number. And this is going to be fundamentally different from a fuel cell. What we'll see for fuel cells we do have ways to change this entropy generation based on our energy, uh, based on our engineering ability. Um, so then we can look at our fuel cell reaction and we have kind of a similar equation, but now we have this electrical work term. 
And this is ultimately what we're trying to do is we're design, trying to design our fuel cell to produce as much electricity as possible. Um, this term in the brackets, delta H minus T delta S, this combination of H minus T delta TS is very, very common in thermodynamics. It occurs over and over and over again. And so because this occurs very frequently, we define it as a new thermodynamic property called the Gibbs free energy or the Gibbs function. So then this term in the uh, parentheses, we shorthand as delta G for the reaction or the Gibbs free energy of the reaction. And so then we have the electrical work is delta G for the reaction minus T entropy being generated. And this becomes a completely general equation. This applies to every single fuel cell. And so we see once again that as entropy generation increases, the electrical work goes down. This delta G is fixed by the conditions of the reaction. So if we say we have hydrogen reacting with oxygen, forming water at a specific temperature, a specific pressure, we fix delta H, we fix delta S, so we fix delta G. So as, in, as engineers, once we are given these conditions, we can't change delta G. That becomes fixed. But as engineers, we can start to change this entropy generation. And so then there is a field of engineering called entropy generation minimization, where you do thermodynamic analyses to identify the processes that generate the most entropy. And then that's where you start to focus your engineering skill, is to redesign these processes that are generating entropy. And so then this entropy generation minus G minus delta G for the reaction minus work over T. And this always has to be greater than or equal to zero. So once again, in theory, we can drive this ent entropy generation to zero. Um, in reality, it's always going to be greater than zero. So just to reiterate for our fuel cell, um, Entropy generation can be decreased through improved engineering. Um, and therefore, the entropy generation is directly related to our engineering ability. And I think kind of one of our goals as engineers, as researchers, are to develop better materials, better processes that, although you may not quantify it in terms of entropy generation, if you develop a new material and it has better performance, then ultimately you are going to be decreasing entropy generation in this fuel cell. So maybe a different perspective than where you're coming from, but in thermodynamics, this is, this is how we quantify the performance. So then to summarize, kind of compare and contrast the combustion reaction and our fuel cell reaction. Um, the entropy generation for combustion completely fixed by the reaction. We have no control over either of these terms once we fix the reactants and the, and the conditions. Um, for our fuel cell, we do have control over this entropy generation. Um, and then this directly leads into the idea that, okay, at least in theory, I can design a completely reversible fuel cell. And this is fundamentally different than a combustion process. Combustion processes are inherently irreversible. In thermodynamics, when we talk about an irreversible process, an irreversible process generates entropy. So going back to this idea about me dropping my keys, very irreversible. But if, if I could attach a string onto my keys, I could start off with the same potential energy, and I could let this go. And at least in theory, if I could remove all of the friction, this could swing down. I could convert my potential energy into kinetic energy. It would swing back up and convert kinetic energy back into potential energy. And as long as there's no friction, this could swing back and forth indefinitely. So we have this conversion of energy from one form to another in a complete, completely reversible process. And this reversible process would not generate any entropy. In reality, I would have friction, and my keys would slowly uh, go down into some stable state down here. And once again, we would be generating entropy throughout this process. Um, and so, let's see.
Okay, so then the maximum work is minus the Gibbs free energy for the reaction, or minus delta H minus CT delta S. And so importantly, we do see a delta S term, as delta S comes from the second law of thermodynamics. And so the second law of thermodynamics does limit the conversion of chemical energy into work. It's just, it's a different limit though than the Carnot efficiency. Once again, the Carnot efficiency was defined for heat, the conversion of heat transfer into work. This term is the conversion of chemical energy into work. So a different energy conversion process, a different second law limitation. So all processes, all real processes generate entropy. And uh, so fuel cells do generate entropy and so our actual electrical work will be less than this delta G of the reaction. And we can trace this back to our entropy being generated. So as entropy is being generated, uh, we start to see a deviation of our electrical work from the delta G of the reaction. And then once again, just to emphasize this, this temperature of the fuel cell entropy generation is the deviation of our work from this ideal work. And so we see a direct correspondence between the decrease in work and this entropy being generated. And so although it's not a perfect definition, um, we do have terms called like lost work in thermodynamics. And this is similar to the lost work term in thermodynamics. So we have some potential to do work, but due to entropy being generated, we're basically degrading this energy and we don't produce as much work as uh, we have the potential to. And once you degrade that energy, you can never bring it back to its former level. So then to start looking at some more details for kind of, if we go assume that we have a um, fuel cell, excuse me, if we assume we knew nothing about fuel cells, we just worked with combustion and we looked at this combustion process and tried to understand, okay, well, why do we have entropy being generated here? Because if you can understand why entropy is generated, you can then start to re-engineer the process. And so then if we look at this process, we have hydrogen and oxygen coming in to some combustion chamber. And the first thing we do is we mix these two. And so if you think about this from a fuel cell perspective, fundamentally different than what you're trying to do in a fuel cell. And so when I was in uh, the, my PhD program, there was a visiting scholar who came from Japan. Um, he was a faculty member in Japan and his entire research was based on how do we enhance mixing. Um, and so mixing is a very irreversible process, creates a lot of entropy. And so this is, so if you mix hydrogen and oxygen, um, you cannot spontaneously unmix them. And so you have entropy being generated here due to this mixing process. I don't know if you can see this or not, but then here you have half reactions. You have hydrogen reacting to form two protons and two electrons. Hydrogen reacting to form two protons and two electrons. And then you have this half reaction, oxygen reacting with four protons, four electrons to form water. And at the molecular level, if you had like a really, really small um, potentiometer that you could read voltage, you could somehow put a probe on this half reaction, somehow put a probe on that half reaction, you would measure a potential difference between the two. So we have this potential that we're very familiar with in fuel cells, and we can think about this existing on a molecular level. So half reactions with some voltage potential difference between the two. And then we have this electron moving from the hydrogen half reaction to the oxygen half reaction. So this electron is basically moving across the voltage difference. And these two re half reactions are very, very close together. That's why you, we mix these together. You bring the oxygen, you bring the hydrogen together very, very closely, and you pass the electron from the hydrogen into the water, uh, into the oxygen, you pass the proton uh, also to form water. And so you have a very, very, very small electrical resistance there between the two. So you can think about this being like a short circuit. So you have a current flowing through uh, a very, very small resistance and you basically have 
the conversion of kind of work, electrical work, at the molecular level into thermal energy. So we're producing thermal energy, and it's basically like a resistive heater, conceptually. Transfer of electrons across this voltage difference, um, and we create thermal energy here. And so then, when we look at this thermodynamic, when we talk about entropy, we think about terms like random and disorganized and uncontrolled. Um, and so definitely we see kind of randomness when we mix hydrogen and oxygen together. Initially we have very ordered hydrogen, very ordered oxygen. We mix them together and we can no longer identify exactly where the hydrogen will be and where the oxygen will be because they're all mixed together. We look at this process of exchanging electrons and exchanging protons and it occurs in very random directions. They're not all moving in the same direction. So once again, we have this idea about a very random, a very uncontrolled reaction here. These reactions occur very, very rapidly. So this random transfer of electrons in random directions also, can we can think about this in terms of entropy being generated. And so we say, okay, this in terms of thermodynamics, in terms of trying to create electricity, is maybe not the best thing in the world. And so we ask ourselves, hmm, I wonder if we can somehow re-engineer this reaction so we take the hydrogen and we take the oxygen, but somehow we don't react them in a way that generates entropy. And so when we look at this, well, what's generating <laughs> entropy? Well, this mixing process is generating entropy. And this actual reaction process, this random transfer of electrons, uh, and we're transferring retron electrons in a very uncontrolled manner. So we have a very, very small electrical resistance there. Um, and so it's an uncontrolled transfer of electrons. And so then we could start there and say, well, let's re-engineer this. And the first thing we do is we put in this electrolyte. And so as engineers, material engineers, we spend a lot of effort. I shouldn't say we because I don't, but materials engineers do. They spend a lot of effort to make this impermeable to hydrogen, impermeable to oxygen. So we want to keep the hydrogen and the oxygen separate. So now we no longer have this, um, this mixing process. And then, rather than having this random control, random transfer of electrons, we say, okay, we need to somehow order our transfer of electrons. So we have this half reaction occurring at the anode. We produce electrons and we produce protons. And the oxygen is sitting over here, and hydrogen really wants to move over to the cathode side to produce water. And so what we as engineers do, or maybe materials engineers, um, they did, once again, they design this electrolyte so it passes protons, but does not pass electrons. So once again, we're putting control onto this, what was once a very chaotic reaction. So we allow protons to pass through here, and these protons are being passed in a very linear way. They're not really, for the most part, they're not moving in random directions like you see here. They're all pretty much moving in a somewhat linear way across here, very ordered transfer of protons. We then take our electrons and we force them through some external circuit where we do some useful work, such as driving a motor to lift some mass. So we have this electrical potential and we push our electrons through this external circuit to do work. The electrons arrive here and they produce water. So then conceptually, we've taken this very random reaction and we've re-engineered it to be a very ordered reaction. And by re-engineering this to be a very ordered reaction, we've reduced the amount of entropy being generated, at least in theory. So then this fuel cell has the potential, in theory, to be completely reversible. We could think about an electrolysis process where we could take water, we could maybe let this mass fall down, and we could split the water into oxygen and hydrogen uh, through electrolysis. And so this would be an example of a reversible process. It occurs in the forward direction, occurs in the reverse direction. Conversely, you can imagine if you have water and you just apply heat 
it would not split up into hydrogen and oxygen. You would also need to apply work to it. So this is a very irreversible reaction because it occurs in one direction, um, very irreversible, so it creates a lot of entropy. At least in theory, this is a very reversible reaction, and we can have this go in either direction. So then we have this fuel cell, and here the fuel cell is being used to do useful work, such as raise a mass. We could replace the motor with something like a light bulb or a resistance heater. And if we replace this motor with a, a resistive heater, and we look at this larger system boundary, this larger system boundary becomes equivalent to a combustion process. We have the conversion of chemical energy into a heat transfer, into thermal energy. You can imagine if you took two wires, or took a wire, and connected your anode to the cathode in your fuel cell without any type of load on it, that wire would very quickly burn. You may have a little fire start. And so basically it becomes like a combustion reaction, very uncontrolled transfer of electrons through here, very rapid. And so then thermodynamically this becomes like a, a um, combustion reaction. Okay, so then we've talked about the, this conversion efficiency of heat transfer into work. We can come up with a similar uh, fuel cell efficiency, energy flow desire divided by, divided by energy flow paid for. So our electrical work divided by delta H for the reaction. This delta H for the reaction is the energy that's released by the reaction. Um, and so then we can substitute in for the work. We see this entropy generation term that comes in here. We could define um, the delta H's cancel out, and we have this formula for the fuel cell efficiency. Um, 1 minus T, temperature of the fuel cell, delta H, S for the reaction divided by delta H. So this first term is completely defined by the reaction and the reaction conditions. You define the reactants, you define the products, you define the temperature and pressure, this first term becomes com completely defined. This second term has this entropy generation term, and once again, this entropy generation is related to our engineering ability. If we're really good engineers, we can start to make that smaller, and we can increase our fuel cell efficiency. And so then, if we were perfect engineers, um, a perfect engineer can make that zero, and we come up with this maximum fuel cell efficiency, delta G divided by delta H for the reaction, or one minus temperature delta S for the reaction divided by delta H. And so we see, once again, this delta S, which is the um, limits imposed by the second law on this conversion process. And so that it looks very different from a Carnot cycle efficiency, but we're still governed by the second law here, delta S. And oftentimes, um, if you start to quantify the performance of your fuel cell, you may quantify it, instead of using delta H, a lot of times it's normalized relative to a heating value. And so you can choose either a lower heating value or you can choose a higher heating value. If you choose a lower heating value, your efficiency will be much, much higher than if you choose the higher heating value. And so conceptually, we have this combustion reaction right here that produces water vapor, and this is our lower heating value. And conceptually, we can think about replacing this combustion reaction right here with our fuel cell and producing work. This second process of condensing out our water, so water vapor here, liquid water there, condensation process, heat transfer, it's not possible to so let's say it's not possible to convert this into work. So I think at least conceptually from a fuel cell perspective, we can say it's not possible to convert this condensation, energy of condensation into work. Um, and so then ultimately, although you have more energy being released, this higher heating value corresponds to higher energy being released, energy of the reaction plus energy of condensation. The energy being released is increasing the amount of work you can produce does not increase by adding this uh, condensation process. So our electrical work, it doesn't matter if we choose a lower heating value or the higher heating value, 
These both are the same. The denominator changes. This is small, that's large. And so then we see that we have a higher efficiency if we choose the lower heating value, lower efficiency if we have to choose the higher heating value. In both cases, though, our electrical work output stays the same. And so when you start to define or look at efficiency, you need to be careful about whether or not you're using that lower heating value or the higher heating value. And so then to compare and contrast this to the Carnot efficiency, this is the Carnot efficiency, and this is our fuel cell efficiency. This is this red line right here is the Carnot efficiency. It increases with increasing TH. So this is TH down here. This could also be the temperature of the fuel cell. And so this is in temperatures degrees Celsius. So 0 to 1400 degrees Celsius. Um, this black line right here is the work being produced by the fuel cell. So this is work or energy, like megajoules per kilomole of hydrogen here. And so then we see that per kilomole of hydrogen, as the temperature goes up, the amount of work goes down. This, let's see, this green line is our fuel cell efficiency. And so we see that while in general the Carnot efficiency goes up with temperature, the fuel cell efficiency goes down with temperature. And we can kind of see this conceptually or qualitatively from this equation. Delta S and delta H are relatively weak functions of temperature. They do change with temperature, but they don't have a very strong temperature dependency. So the second term, for the most part, depends on the temperature of the fuel cell. So in general, as the temperature of the fuel cell goes up, the second term becomes large. As the second term becomes large, your maximum fuel cell efficiency goes down. And so we see this general trend of fuel cell efficiency going down with temperature. So what's happening right here? We see this discontinuity. And this discontinuity occurs at 100 degrees Celsius. So what about what's happening here that's causing this discontinuity? Does anyone have a guess? Right. It's changing phase. And so then when I did this, I assumed that the water was being produced at one atmosphere. And so below 100 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere, you have liquid water being produced. This would be the, lower, the higher heating value. And so you see that the, the higher heating value has a relatively lower efficiency. Um, and then I said, OK, at 100 degrees Celsius, we have a phase change. This is water vapor being produced. And we see a, a higher efficiency. The actual work being produced per kilomole of hydrogen does not change across that discontinuity. So right at 100 degrees Celsius, whether we're in the liquid or the vapor phase, the work per unit kilomole of hydrogen does not change. But if we define our efficiency like this, I think this maybe just died. If we, hmm? battery, battery died. Um, so then if we define our delta H as being equal to our heating value, we see this sensitivity to the heating value on how we define our efficiency. Um, so then for a possible like quiz question, um, I could either give you this and ask you to explain what happens at this discontinuity, or maybe sketch the general trends for the fuel cell efficiency and the uh, Carnot efficiency, maybe sketch this reversible work. So once again, the reversible work, you don't see this discontinuity when you see the phase change. So kilojoules of work per kilomole of fuel. Um, and so I think in many ways, like kilojoules or megajoules of work per kilomole of hydrogen, this may be a better metric than the classical fuel cell efficiency. So this leads into kind of the Nernst equation. And I think that some other people will be talking about the Nernst equation in detail. I just want to step through this to draw this connection. So anytime that you see the same concept being discussed by multiple lecturers, then it must be a pretty important concept. And so then basically, we can divide this delta G term into a pressure-dependent term, excuse me, a temperature-dependent term. 
this not sign, not superscript, indicates our a reference pressure. And so this delta G, ref, delta G reaction not and it indicates delta G at P reference. And then we have this second term where we quantify the deviation of delta G uh, based on pressure. And this A is an activity coefficient and for ideal gases, this would be like the, the partial pressure of your species divided by the reference pressure. For a liquid, the uh, activity is one. And so then we can rewrite our reversible fuel cell work in terms of this delta G naught at the reference pressure minus the second term. Um, to do, let's see how much I wrote this, I'm not too sure it's critical. I'm gonna, so basically, if we talk about a rate of work, we put a dot on top. So we've been talking about work, units of like kilojoules, if we divide the work by delta T, let delta T go to zero, we have the rate of work, units of like kilowatts, or kilojoules per second. Um, okay, so then kind of converting into current and voltages, our current would be like our molar flow rate of electrons, so N dot is molar flow rate of electrons times Faraday's constant, Faraday's constant is 96,485 kilojoules per volt per kilomole of electron. Um, we can look at our half reaction. We say that for every mole of hydrogen, we have two moles of electrons being produced. And so I can then substitute some of these ideas into here. Uh, solve for my um, voltage. And so the voltage is the electrical work divided by 2F, where the 2 indicates two moles of electrons per mole of hydrogen. Looking at our maximum electrical potential, this would be for our reversible case. Um, I can rewrite this in terms of the delta G naught. And so we call this first part delta G naught. Um, the reversible electrical potential, there's a naught sign here at the reference pressure. And then we have this correction as we move away from the reference pressure based on the activity coefficients. So this would be at temperature T and at standard pressure, and this would be the deviation from the pressure. And so I think that um, this is uh, the NERS potential, and Professor Lamy, I think, will be talking more about this later on. And then we can look at the actual fuel cell potential, where, once again, we have, this is the reversible potential, this is our entropy generation, and so we de see a decrease from the reversible potential to the actual potential that scales with the entropy being generated. And so then we can talk about the entropy being generated for different processes. And so J can refer to activation losses. So we have activation losses at the anode and the cathode. And so then um, thermodynamically you could come up with the entropy being generated at the anode and the cathode. And so because you tend to have larger losses at the cathode, the entropy generation at the cathode would also be larger. Um, J could refer to ohmic losses, since this would be the um, usually concentrated in the electrolyte, and this would be related to the transfer of protons through the electrolyte. So if you're working on uh, synthesizing membranes, one of your goals, although you may not realize it, if you develop a, a membrane with a higher performance, you're in essence developing a membrane that generates less entropy. And then we have the concentration losses um, at the anode and the cathode. This would be related to the mass transfer to and from the electrodes. So if you come up with a new uh, channel design that has increased performance, this new channel design would result in less entropy being generated. So to kind of summarize, we have this classical polarization curve. Um, and we have what's called a like thermal new thermoneutral potential, like 1.4 volts. And this would be if we knew nothing, or if the second law did not exist, and we assume that we could convert all of the energy being released by the reaction, delta H, into work, we would have this thermoneutral potential, delta H divided by two, or minus delta H divided by two F. And so then that kind of becomes like a, the first law limit. And then we can start to see how the second law starts to decrease this uh, actual voltage. And so we have this difference between 
this like equilibrium potential at some temperature pressure and concentrations from the thermoneutral potential. So this is dictated by the second law once you dictate your reaction. So species reacting, species being produced, you come up with delta S, T is fixed by the, by the conditions. And so this is imposed by the second law um, and it's something that as engineers, once you fix the reaction, once you fix the temperature, you can't change that. And so now we're down here. This would be like the reversible fuel cell potential right here. Um, and as you know, this bottom curve is our actual uh, cell potential versus current density. So we have current density here, milliamps per centimeter squared cell potential on the left. And so as we go to higher current densities, we see the voltage come down. And we can quantify this in terms of entropy being generated. So we can say, okay, this deviation here is due to activation losses and is due to entro like entropy generated um, due to reaction kinetics. So we can quantify this as being, okay, this is due to activation entropy being generated. We have this part down here. We can relate this to ohmic losses. And so this would be entropy being generated um, in the um, electrolyte due to the transfer of ions. And then down here, we have the um, concentration polarization losses, which would be the entropy being generated due to concentration gradients. And so then as we start to improve the fuel cell performance, as these polarization losses become smaller, what we're doing is we're changing this entropy being generated. So then, once again, kind of coming at this from a mechanical engineering point of view, where we have this weight of a Carnot efficiency wrapped around our neck, um, the the performance of a, a reversible fuel cell is not limited by the Carnot efficiency. The Carnot efficiency refers specifically to the conversion of heat into work. The fuel cell is fundamentally different. We're not converting heat into work, we're converting chemical energy into work. We go through different processes, different types of reactions. And so by re-engineering the reaction, um, we re-engineer this energy conversion process. Um, and so unlike the Carnot efficiency, which, which increases with increasing temperature. In the first hour, I talked about how for gas turbines, there's been an incredible amount of, of energy trying to increase the temperature of gas turbines because it tends to increase the performance. Uh, we don't see this with fuel cells. And so we see very good performance of fuel cells, at least theoretically, at low temperatures. Um, we can think about conceptually and also quantitatively um, all of our losses in terms of entropy generation. And so if you were a thermodynamicist once again and you started with this combustion reaction, you would say, wow, this combustion reaction gener generates a lot of entropy. I wonder if I could somehow redesign this. And so if you were to redesign the combustion reaction, you end up with a fuel cell reaction. And so then if you're re-engineering the fuel cell to have better performance, whether you realize it or not, you're re-engineering this to have a smaller amount of entropy being generated. Um, the maximum performance, when I say maximum, I mean like theoretical performance of a fuel cell that's fixed by the chemistry. And then we have some deviations. We have this maximum performance, we have the actual performance, and we have this deviation, and we can quantify this deviation in terms of entropy generation. And this amount of entropy generation is related to our engineering ability. If we're really, really good engineers, we can reduce this. Um, and so, to kind of conclude, there is a field called uh, thermodynamics called entropy generation minimization, where you use the idea of entropy generation to guide design. Um, and so then, if you were working through this process, you would look at your fuel cell, try to identify the processes that generate the most entropy. And these processes that generate the most entropy are thermodynamically the processes that have the most room for improvement. And then you could um, start to do design based on how you reduce this entropy generation. So then that concludes my lecture. Thank you very much for your time. And I can answer the questions.